Ah, and now yeah. we're live. We're live. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, hello. Um, I have had some terrible technical difficulties, but we are here now. Um, is there anyone here? <laughs> oh, how do I say if they're here? Um, so there should be a little comment section. So mm -hmm. there's like a private chat and then a, a comments. And so if people start commenting, they'll appear there. Okay. 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 So um, I guess we'll just begin then. So hello. Uh, hello. My name is Roisin and welcome to the Big Book Book Club. Um, our first book that we read in January and February was The Makioka Sisters by Junichiro Tanazaki, um, which is a Japanese classic from the 1950s. Um, about four sisters in Japan in the 1930s. Um, so we've been reading this one. Um, and uh, so next month we will be reading War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy. So if you are ready to join us um, on this epic mission, um, I hope you will. Uh, and I will not be alone in that. And today I am joined by Matthew Sharapa. So Matthew, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Matthew Sharapa of the channel Matthew Sharapa. Um, and I'm excited because this was a book that I had been long wanting to read. And so when you asked and gave me like a list of options to pick, this was the one I was like, please, let's do this. Um, so I'm happy to have read this book and I'm excited to chat about it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was just going to, yeah, I was going to ask you as well. Um, so since this is the big book book club, uh, what's your like history with big books? What's your favorite big book? Are you a big book reader in general? So we were talking about this uh, just before the stream started, mm -hmm. but like I've read a lot of urban fantasy and like fantasy in my life. And yeah. those are sometimes 800 page books. And I don't even really think of them as big books in the same way I do like some sort of like chunky literary fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so I do read a lot of a lot of 500 plus page books, big books, if you will. Um, I just don't necessarily categorize those mm -hmm. books as them because they are so like binge worthy. Yeah. Um, but even then, I do I do enjoy some some chunky lit fic. I think it's something that I often feel like a craving for mm -hmm. um, in the way that you want to just dig into something. Um, for sure. Cool. So, um, what was I going to say? <laughs> uh, so yeah. So, um, <laughs> sorry. The Makioka Sisters. Then. So, did you enjoy reading this book? What did you think of it? What was your? I did. I did. Um, I vaguely knew about it in terms mm -hmm. of just like what the story was. I had seen like clips of the movie version that exists of it you know i i kind of had some implications going in but it ended up being i think far more readable than i had expected i think that's the word yeah. that we've thrown around a couple of times um it very much had that serialized feel because mm -hmm. it, it was um and therefore that episodic kind of propulsive nature of it just made it such a pleasure to read yeah. and i was able to also pick it up over time. I started this early February. I finished it about two and a half weeks later. Mm -hmm. So a lot longer than I spend time with most books, um, yeah. but I'd never found myself losing the thread. So this was ultimately a, a pleasure. How about mm. you? Yeah, similarly, I, I read started reading it in January and I finished it yesterday. So I definitely spent a good deal of time with this book. Um, I had like segmented it out to read a certain amount of pages each week, um, but I ended up reading like nearly half of it this week so I uh, did not follow my plans at all um but yeah I really I did enjoy it it was I um read okay so it's a completely different book but I read The Sailor Who Fell From Grace With The Sea by Yukio Mishima and I had this same edition of vintage books and so I saw that like all of the other ones I was like okay I want to read all of them now um and obviously that one is tiny this one is not tiny so um it was yeah that's how I heard about it but I'm really glad I that you chose to read this one because I think it's quite like you said it's episodic so it does have a feeling like similar to a lot of classics um of that like thing themes repeating themselves and there's like a lot of um like even actual scenes repeating themselves and the like the sort of subtle differences between those things um but it is it was so much more readable than I was concerned that it might be like a lot of the time I don't get on with mid-century classics I don't know what it is about them but they're not always for me um but I did yeah I did enjoy this I think it was 
very readable but then I'd be like but has anything actually happened have, have, have they actually like I'm having a nice time but what is actually happening was kind of my feeling for a lot of it oh for um, sure like I, you know it's funny because like I think like there's something especially about translated fiction in general that often can feel unapproachable but like anybody who's read Jane Austen could easily yeah. Yeah. easily get into this and yeah. it, it doesn't really have that sort of like mid-century feel to it mm. in the way that so many other books from its time do yeah um, yeah. yeah yeah so yeah and it was um very much more domestic than I was expecting as well like one of the things I mentioned to you um previously that I wanted to talk about was like this is a really big point of Japanese history that this is set in like the 1930s um and like the expansion of the Japanese empire and the beginning of the second world war and that's so not touched upon in this book. And I found that a surprise. I thought there would be more, like it talks about the, in the synopsis, it talks about like the da slow downfall of the Makioka family. And I felt like that, that didn't feel, I thought that that would be more to do with politics and also more at the forefront. And it's just kind of slightly mentioned. I feel like a lot of this book was, everything's under the surface that's happening. Like on the surface, it doesn't seem like much is going on. Um, but yeah. Well, I think though, so like the story itself is incredibly mm. domestic and it is yeah. very insular and you are getting like the story of sisters, but there's enough going on in the natural world that I think is mm. like in many ways uh, substituting what might be larger political forces at work mm -hmm. because there are elements, but you don't see like soldiers walking around. You don't yeah. really see like, you know, there's not like it's not like hashtag war yeah. in the way that I feel like we might expect or like impending war. But I think um, there is enough, like there's floods, there's, you know, there, there are things that strike and there is an emphasis in Junichiro Tanazaki's writing about the natural world that I think mm -hmm. is really kind of pointing to that sort of like degradation, decay, mm -hmm. impending violence, doom throughout. Yeah, because I, I actually read somewhere that the the novel's title in Japanese is uh, Sasa Mayuki. Um, I don't speak any Japanese, so apologies for that, which means lightly falling snow. Um, and it's also used in classical Japanese poetry to talk about the cherry blossom as well as, as lightly falling snow. So that like nature theme is definitely um, what comes through from like the title and everything as well. And then also um, in Sasa Mayuki, it's the same Yuki as Yukiko. Um, and to like hint that she's the main character of the novel. And when I read that, I was like, I'm, it doesn't feel like she's the main character of the novel to me. I know like the whole thing is kind of driven by trying to get her married. A lot of the, it seems to be like, that's what the whole, what they're trying to do. And the reason that they're having issues with Taiko is because she's like causing problems with the potential marriage and stuff. But I, I thought we were much more focused on Sechiko than Yukiko. I think in terms of like who we paid attention to more, yes. But in terms of like, if this is a book about a downfall of a family, it is all Yukiko's fault. Like <laughs> ultimately like, she is the problem. Um, um, her, her passivity towards marriage, her mm. kind of desire to remain in some sort of like limbo with her sisters yeah. is in part the reason why their family can't progress or move forward. Mm. It's why Taiko has such a, hard time living her life and yeah. embracing kind of like her freedom that she wants to mm. um because her elder sisters basically did the thing like they yeah. sorted it out they they were able to do what their family wanted them to do whether or not that was ultimately successful or the correct choice i mean it, mm. I, I, I i don't really think so um <laughs> but in terms of like what this family thinks it should look like yukiko mm. is the problem yeah. Um, and I like the idea of her as a main character or like as the title, because mm. it's kind of like, what do we do with Yukiko? Like that, to yeah. me, that's what that title implies. And like, yeah, were yeah. this book titled that, I think it <laughs> would have an edge of comedy that is just non-existent in the book. <laughs> but like, ironically reading it, I think is definitely felt. Mm, yeah, there was definitely an edge of humor that I like the way that the sisters get exasperated with each other, but like don't express it at the same time. All the times that um, Sachiko was just like crying to her husband because it, it, even she was like, oh, he's gonna be so upset about this. And then she just ends up crying on top of him and he has to comfort her. Um, I thought that was really funny the way she's just like so frustrated all the time. I really liked her as a character. 
Oh, I did too. I mean, I love I love any sort of like ill tempered, like self important kind mm-hmm. of person. Like uh, she she is a mischief maker, and I'm always like yeah. drawn to that. And it's a, a mischief maker, very different from Taiko, mm-hmm. who I feel like is a little bit more altruistic or at least optimistic. Yeah. yeah. Whereas like uh, I, I find Sachiko to be a, <laughs> a little bit more curmudgeonly. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. She's somebody oh, wow. who like cares about the loss of glory deeply. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that makes her, I think, satisfying to read mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. What did you think about the sisters in general? Like what was your feelings about their like relationships and things? I was surprised. I kind of expected them to be more different from one another. Mm. Um, and I know like in the movie version, it's separated by seasons and kind of like each sister takes a season. And like, I kind of went in with that expectation in many ways. Mm -hmm. And they are different enough. Like we have like Tsurugo who is, you know, kind of unemotional, almost like void, verging on lazy. And then Mm -hmm. you have Sachiko, which is a very nice contrast of like bad tempered and self-important. Yukiko is like, almost like melancholic, like she's Mm -hmm. just full of worry and doubt and uh, malaise in a way. And then you have Taiko who's far more enlivened and like you Mm -hmm. have, you know, she's, she's the, you know, if we're talking like Masha Olga Irina, she's the arena of the group, you know, it's, Mm -hmm. I I think that um, their contrast is interesting, but they are all so blissfully stubborn that I think (laughs) that is the one connecting factor that does make them feel like sisters. Yeah. Um, in a very authentic way, which I thought was mm-hmm. very surprising. Because I think oftentimes in a novel like this, it could so easily be done where they're like, so different from one another. And like, mm-hmm. not at all. But like, they, they feel very much related to me. Yeah. They feel very much in, in touch with one another. Mm-hmm. And it's nice to see how Yukiko and Taiko were able to kind of travel throughout the book to different households and different places to kind of yeah. like tie everything together. And I think that kept it pretty cohesive. Mm. I kept thinking of... Little Women, um, because it's just it's four sisters, isn't it? It's a kind of the obvious like comparison point. Um, but I was like, I just, like a- the Amy and the Beth are quite obvious in this book. Um, yep. I feel like there's not really a Joe. I guess so. She goes as stubborn and filled with her own self importance as Joe, but um, and I don't think Turuko is like mega tall. But it's just you kind of. It just, I I couldn't help the comparison. It felt like it was set a lot earlier as well. And I think that's probably to do with like Japanese culture and things as well. Um, because it did feel like the whole, the younger sister can't get married until the older sister gets married. It felt like there's, and because they were an old fashioned family, I think they were acting in a much more old fashioned way. Well, not only old fashioned, but like they don't have parents. So I think yeah. in many ways they kind of took the stead of their parents' generation and that kind of yeah. like, in many ways thrust them back in time mm. um, to the point where they were, yeah, and feel, felt very aged, felt very mm. traditional. Um, and there are traditions, but I feel like their adherence to them felt of a different generation. And like, you really only have Taiko who's like, maybe I want to live somewhere else. Maybe I want to do a <laughs> thing. Maybe I want yeah. to have a job. Like, yeah, um, she's kind of like that symbol of like freedom that or like yeah. escape from tradition. Um, and she, and she I think, if, we're talking about favorite characters. She, she mm. was definitely mine. Oh, um. <laughs> mine too. 100%. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I always like the character who's a bit more like rebellious more yeah. than the characters who go along with the tradition. But yeah. she's she's also the one who wears Western clothing all the time. I thought mm-hmm. there was a lot of like clothing and the representations of what it, like their their position and their emotions. I felt like a lot of it, all the time it was reflected in their clothing as well. So there was talk of like, when it was a really hot day, but because they were going to the Miyai, they had to wear a, um, a kimono and they were just sweating. And it just, the physicality of like the kimono, I felt like was a really big part of the book as well. Like the loosening of their OBs and things. Yeah, there's there's a big emphasis on edifice and appearance. Yeah. I mean, we open with a scene of applying makeup and that chapter yeah. ends in vitamin shots. And like, yeah. I think it's instantaneously that I, I read that chapter and I was like, oh, this is a book about decay. This is a book about <laughs> aging and decay and death. Because and they're constantly being referred to as so young looking. They just look young all the time. Yeah. And I'm like, there's something so insidious here. There's something so like... <laughs> I could because if they're if they're so um concerned with health with mm. with virality um the rest of the book 
is only going to be a state of decline. Yeah. Um, and I find it to be very satisfying. But similarly, like the the, the shedding of a kimono, I mean, it's a mm. process. It's, you know, yeah. it's something that, I don't know, Tycho's interest in Western wear is, uh, is, is interesting to me. I'd be curious if there, I, I don't know enough about uh, Japanese history and Japanese mm. history in relation to the war to have a, a good thesis or, or a firm comment on it. But I, I do think that there is a, a sort of metaphor of conquest afoot and expansion. Mm. And I wonder if she in, symbolizes this in some way or the relation yeah. to it. Um, I don't, I would, I want somebody very smart to talk about that <laughs> so that I could yeah. read the article about it and have an opinion. Yeah. Someone, someone with a background in Japanese history would be, would yeah. be great. Um, because again, like I, I haven't read a huge amount of Japanese literature and I, it's not a area of the world that I know a huge amount about, to be honest. Um, but I did, I know like some things um, more from a Korean perspective. I feel like I've read a lot more Korean literature than I have Japanese literature. Um, so yeah, I, I, that time period, you see it in a, from the other perspective. It's a bit, it's interesting, especially when they were friends with the Nazis. <laughs> that was like. Yeah, in many, Japan's, especially yeah. at this time period and before, they're not, we don't like them. Like, it's no. like especially like as somebody with an American upbringing, like it's like, yeah. you know, the, the, the perspective is interesting and, and Korean colonization mm. um, is a, a huge, terrible part of history. And I think mm -hmm. um, it is only recently that the US or, or in the English language has received translations of texts that really kind yeah. of like, hone in on that hmm. because in a contemporary setting uh, japan is this thrilling country whose major export is like culture media and, and technology, technology. yeah and but like that context is so devoid of of hmm. what is a history that is like 50 years a, a short amount of time prior yeah um so I, I don't know. It's 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 interesting to read something that is like relatively recent in publication, mm. like I don't know, contemporary to so many other books that I think we all were taught in school. Yeah. Um, but has this air of like I don't know um, relevance that I think is is kind of missing from other things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, because the way that yeah, I'm not sure what I was going to say there. Um, <laughs> Um, sorry, I was just trying to get my thoughts together. So, um, there, there was we were talking a little bit earlier about like nature and the the use of nature in the book and the, those natural disasters as being related to history. Um, I did think it was I, that the part, particularly with the flood, is the part that I was like felt so compelled to read. I felt like I could not put it down. I needed to know what was going to happen, and I think. The peril that like Tycho in particular always <laughs> seems to end up in. Um, it's so interesting the way that it's told because it feels like really intense in the moment and then it's just gone. Like the the fall is so like strong in the, in that section. Um, after all. Yeah, in many ways, I mean it, that is a scene that reminds us that this is an episodically written novel mm -hmm. that like that this was published chapter by chapter. Mm -hmm. um, because it is so thrilling, it is so sudden, and in many ways it resolves so neatly. Yeah. Um, because what if people stopped reading at that point? You know, you, you don't mm -hmm. quite know. Um, but it is also like kind of an iconic scene. Like it is probably yeah. one of the most like stark memories I have of reading this book mm -hmm. um, because it is so drastic in comparison to the sort of quiet domesticity mm -hmm. that, that we have previously experienced. And it's uh, a moment where I think the book really does open up because in the first book, it, 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 this, this novel is in three parts. In the first part, mm -hmm. it, not much happens. It is like a couple of prospective marriages, some rejection, some snobbishness, makeup and vitamin shots, like mm -hmm. great time. And then the second book happens and it's like travel, flood, <laughs> lost love, like yeah. infection, disease. Like it's like, it suddenly just it escalates to this drastic extent. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I loved it because it became far more thrilling to read, but it's also yeah. like, I'm sure that there is some commentary built into there for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was just such an interesting sudden juxtaposition from the earlier part of the book. And I, I did find though that everything just got wrapped up so easily that I was a bit like, especially, I can't remember his name, but the um, the photographer man who just, he's no longer useful, so he'll die. Like it was just, he just died instantly to like make things easier. Um, and well, then- 
in many ways, I felt like it was like Yukiko never really outright rejects her suitors. Yeah. Like, and I think that there's this sort of like fun narrative of like, is she sabotaging this or is she like cosmically willing this to like occur? <laughs> like, what is what is going on to the mm -hmm. point where like Tycho can't find love? Yeah. Like the the universe is refusing her love mm. because Yukiko still hasn't gotten married. This like yeah. like cosmic adherence to tradition, and I think that I don't know. There was something that like tickled me about that. That it was like, mm -hmm. yeah, he dies, but like he died because Yukiko's not married yet. Like he's not <laughs> allowed to exist. He just can't. Like if Yukiko mm. were married, he probably wouldn't have died. You know, <laughs> so she's she's got blood on her hands. Kind of. I don't know. It feels <laughs> It feels like that. It feels like if, if we do if we do posit Yukiko as the central character, like mm. that of course makes sense. It thematically is vital to happen because she's ruining everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I di I didn't think she was that awful until you started talking about her. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I just thought she was annoying because she couldn't talk on the phone. <laughs> I mean, there is that, but you know, this is somebody who you know is so ambivalent towards mm. this, and like in many ways, I feel like we are supposed to feel sympathy for her. You know, yeah. arranged marriages, forced marriages, marriages to men who are much older, who you know, fam you know, families aren't as wealthy. You know, yeah. I don't know. We're supposed. To, I I think there is sympathy there, but ultimately, mm -hmm. what the book does is turns the tables. So in the first yeah. two books, she's rejecting everyone, or the the cosmos is rejecting everyone <laughs> for her. But then in the third book, nobody will take her. Yeah. Like it it is this kind of dramatic flip of like, oh no, they've lost their shot. Mm. And now everyone's screwed. Yeah. It's so interesting as well because you're talking about like Yukiko's ruining everything for Taiko. But then in the book, also I feel like it's also like Taiko's ruining everything for Yukiko. Like all of the rumors about her, all of her like being kind of a fast woman or whatever, go like she doesn't care that Yukiko is about to get married and or is trying to get married and she doesn't care about like her impact on everything she's like fuck this I'm bored now and I'm gonna go do what I want and I, I feel like it's like there is the feeling that she's been trapped for so long like she wanted to marry um I've forgotten everyone's name oh um the, the other bloke that she doesn't end up marrying okay boy that's what they call him um she wanted to marry him so when she was so young and that couldn't happen and I guess at that point she thought it would just be a few years and then it, it goes on and on and on I feel like there's a lot of feeling of endlessness in this book like of of everything's happening but nothing's happening and the uh, the repetition of them going to see the cherry blossoms falling and the snow and all of the like the repeating seasons over and over kind of give you that feeling I, I was kind of confused as to when we were in time for a lot of it um and then at the end they start to introduce like oh it's 1938 or whatever like they actually start giving you dates um which yeah uh what did you think of the ending like it's so abrupt it just happened all of a sudden it's like we have very slow then loads of drama and then it's just over I I mean, the implication of, like, war halting everything is there, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, I think yeah. we get a certain amount of, like, real life, yeah, everything was overturned and upset. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it literally ends in shit, which I think is hilarious <laughs> and, like, points to the satire that I think is throughout the text, but yeah. also points to this kind of, like, recurring theme of decay and degradation. And, like, I think... Um, when something starts to rot, it only gets worse. Mm. And I think in many ways that sort of like last zinger of a one-liner yeah. um, speaks to that. Yeah. Um, cool. So I, you know, I, yeah, it, it, it just like once the flood happens, everything speeds up to a, a tumultuous extent, goes wild. But, you know, and I, I, part of it is like how much of this was like Junichiro's contract coming to an end with the publication. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, um, you got to wrap it up somehow. And yeah, as much yeah. as we would love these like episodic idleness lingerings of this family, like, I wonder if it was literally like he only had a certain number of publications left to finish this story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is true. I'm um, talking about the episodic nature of it. They reference Anna Karenina in this, uh, which I think was also an episodic 
book, a book that was published like that. Um, and I found that really interesting that they suddenly had like Levin and the Russians arrive. Um, and it's not very similar to Anna Karenina, but there is that feeling of could Tycho be an Anna, I feel like, was um, there. But she was the one who was closest to the Russians and would do impressions of the old one and things. And I felt like there was that sense of because she does get pregnant um, and that is that also happens to Anna. And um, so there's this feeling of foreboding when she gets sick, especially at the end there when she gets the medicine in this book is wild. Like, I am so confused by all the illnesses. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was uh, that feeling of I felt like that added to this feeling of like, is something bad actually going to happen? Is this book actually going to go very dark with it? Well, I think there's this sort of I I wish I like again, I wish I knew more about the history or perspective mm -hmm. to to create a better thesis about it. But like, is in many ways what happens to Tycho with regard to that kind of speaking to whether or not she should have adhered to family tradition values, et cetera? Yeah. Like, is it kind of like, oh, you do this, you start to die? Like, <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't I don't really know, but I yeah. think there is a little bit of that, that the further mm -hmm. she strays from her family or her family's intentions, the more peril she's put into, yeah. flood included, death included, like, you know, illness, like, mm -hmm. I think there is a lot of like cosmos in effect. Like yeah. <laughs> there is a lot of kind of um, karma, I think, built into it. Um, I just don't quite know the book's stance on it either way. Yeah, um, I feel you know. like it, it. I feel like that a lot about a lot of it. Actually, it feels like it's very subtle in terms of like its perspective or the what it's trying to say is very subtle. And I do wonder if that's as both of us not like being super au fait with Japanese culture maybe if we were Japanese we would be more aware of it because it is a high context culture where you like um things are things are not said a lot of the time and I feel like that was clear in this book too well it was also written during a time of heavy censorship as well oh, yeah, so I'm sure like the subtlety is like in like that's there for a reason like yeah. I'm sure that um this is a, a book written for perhaps you know people who could decode but um <laughs> yeah yeah. Oh, I, forgot, I had something to say, and now it has gone out of my head. Um, yeah. As I said a minute ago, the medicine in this book was wild, and there was a real lot of sickness, and um, that seemed to be like a really recurring theme like um the daughter as well was was it scarlet fever she got at one point or something else i don't remember specifically you don't remember her. yeah but i but i think it is a point where like they do reject a man because of his mother's perhaps hereditary dementia yeah, yeah. and like that does kind of then feel karmic that like mm -hmm. they rejected this man who could have otherwise been a lovely suitor um, and now everyone's gonna get sick yeah everyone's gonna get sick like there i don't know there is that kind of I don't know. I keep saying cosmos. I need a better word, but like, <laughs> it feels that way. Yeah, and the the dark spot as well over Yukiko's eye that like comes and goes. Um, like she has a black mark against her, literally on her face. Um, yeah. <laughs> I thought that was super interesting, especially as like you were saying, they're so obsessed with image and with the way they look, and this is like a very clear mark against her that they're so concerned that that one little feature of her face will stop her from getting married, not with all of the rest of the stuff that's going on around it. Yeah, it's it's surprisingly both and not a book about vanity. Like, mm. it's not really, a like, you know, with the first scene being the application of makeup, you would expect this to be, like, a, a critique on vanity. Mm. And it, it is in that, like, uh, this is a family who values their status, their tradition, you know, all of this stuff. But it it doesn't really go as deep as I perhaps would want it to, mm -hmm. or it's like not quite as concerned with it in the way that I think we might expect a book like this to be. That like yeah. in its domesticity, it doesn't really dive deep into that because I think the one thing that the sisters all share is that defense of one another. Mm -hmm. Um that they are frustrated, they're 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 put off, you know, whatever. But like they still kind of, it's not ever really their fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's always something out to get them. But 
you said the cosmos is, so I suppose they are right. Um, but the the letter, the letter from um, Tuko when after Tycho's been sick and she's like she might die, and she writes that letter that is just like so dismissive, and she's just like, oh, it's a bit cold here in Tokyo. Like she's just completely unconcerned, and I felt like that was that bit actually shocked me because I felt like she'd barely been. She wasn't because she's in Tokyo. She's far away. She's not always part of the book. She's just like a presence that they have this older sister who is like watching them. And she's also the one who is the most central to the like decay. Like her house is literally moldy and decaying. And she, there's one line about bad stock options <laughs> that they've lost loads of money in the in the main house. Um, and so she's she's like just a presence, just an idea for a lot of it. A lot of the time they're like, what will the main house think? What will that they think but I hadn't really grasped her as a character um because I feel like she was so not present except when they we just knew that the two youngest didn't want to go to Tokyo and there was something about her that made them not want to go to Tokyo and when she received that letter I was like oh that makes sense because she does not give a shit about you no there's this, this like stoicism like mm. in, imbued in her that I feel like is really interesting or this this I don't know I wonder how much of it has to do with her marriage and I I'd be curious to know more about that. Um, mm. How much of a role she feels like she can actually take in her family's future or like, yeah. does she know something that the other sisters don't that we know that they don't know, you know, like, is it, cause we know, but like, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I think that's kind of what propels uh, Sachiko to be such an interesting character is like, she's mm -hmm. fighting and nobody, nobody else really, yes. nobody cares. <laughs> Yeah, she's the one trying to hold everything together. Um, very, I feel like very chaotically. She's not like, she's not all there. Um, there was a lot of roles of older women in this book as well that I thought was really interesting, particularly because the sisters, they don't have a mother, so they don't have someone to do that for them. Um, it's always like older women, what do they call them? Like the gangsters or something? The lady gangsters who like come and try and arrange the marriage for them. I found those characters very like there's a lot of humor there as well and it's very telling about the the culture that they're in the like the high class culture that um these women now that they're married they're organized they're like they're like mrs bennett but they're like capable mrs bennett <laughs> like out there like dragging these men to them like the the second to last man who rejected her because she wouldn't talk to him on the phone um he's like dragged there against his will when his wife's like just died and they're like you're ready to go already it seemed like marriage is such a status thing in this book um not just because you need to marry someone of your status but because you need to have the status of married like to be in society you need to have that status and i think that especially yukiko and taiko's being so young as well like looking so young is kind of a comment on them not being women like they don't have the power that these older women have they don't have the ability to go out and do things for themselves or well, they do but it's very frowned upon when they do and they get sick and nearly die so. yeah I, I think that it is interesting to to view their youth their physical youth or their their the artifice of youth as like mm -hmm. a commentary on their lacking ascent into womanhood or wifedom yeah. Um, I think that's really interesting. And it, it, it is because like Tycho is somebody who was finding fulfillment elsewhere. Yeah. Um, she makes dolls. She was selling them. Like she could yeah. theoretically like, you know, not that she's going to create like a doll empire and become <laughs> rich, but like there is this kind of unknown territory of her fending for herself or like making her own income that like feels dangerous in many ways. Yeah. And like, nobody really wanted to respect it but like mm. she is given a certain amount of time to like whenever she has to leave the doll business like she was given some time to kind of like close it up yeah 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 and she wasn't allowed to sew and she wasn't allowed to sew and then all of a sudden Sajiko is like getting her customers so that she can sew um towards the end of the book and also she it isn't until she's pregnant that she starts to look old like they start describing her not just as like obviously looking pregnant but as looking old all of a sudden um because she is going to be a mother did the doctor accidentally murder that baby oh um uh, <laughs> i mean it's framed as a miscarriage i think 
Yeah. Um, and to me, it is kind of like yet another cosmic punishment. Mm. Um, because he I said something know. about his hand slipping. He was like, the baby came out alive and then my hand slipped. Oh, I don't know. I'd have to reread it. Yeah. Um, I remember being a little bit yeah. wary of it. I, I took it in the same way that I think the characters did. Yeah. Um, like a stillbirth. Yeah. Yeah. It was, all of the doctors in this book were so, being, uh, like, not good at being doctors. They were useless doctors all the time. And I... I, found, I don't know why that, that was there, what, what the theme, what that was about, why they had so many different doctors. They had the one doctor they liked, but he would never show up until like two in the morning. And then they had all these other doctors who wouldn't give injections. It was, they were very obsessed with injections. I was very, like, it was a very medicalized book in a lot of ways, but it felt super old fashioned as well. It felt like it wasn't, like, I know the 1950s is not like now modern medicine, but it felt even more, like even less medical than than I would expect. They it felt like they were just guessing a lot of the time what to do and it and even what was wrong. Like they had all these weird diseases I've never heard of. There's a lot of like misdiagnoses too. There's mm -hmm. a lot of like, oh they have this, mm, maybe they have that. And like it is it is prevalent throughout. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so um does does anyone watching have anything they want to say or um any thoughts or themes that they uh notice that they wanted to mention or if you're watching this in post we will be in the comments lurking to respond <laughs> that is true <laughs> or was there any other themes that you want to talk about Matthew I think we covered most of the stuff that I found exciting I mm. um hadn't really had a fully formed thought about kind of the karmic punishment of it all until we <laughs> chatted about it but I I would like I would read somebody smarter than me writing an essay about that I feel like that'd be cool <laughs> like <laughs> um I you know, I ultimately want to kind of reiterate just if somebody feels uh, hesitant to pick this up or feels like they wouldn't find it approachable or the, you know, the writing, it is so easy to read. Mm -hmm. It really is. Um, as absurd as some parts are, um, I think if you read any classic, quote unquote, this is definitely something that does not feel its length to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can be savored simultaneously as binged. Um, yeah. And I, I, I really loved it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it too. I definitely agree with that. I would second that. It was the sort of book where I sat down and I'd read like 50 pages without having to think about it. It wasn't a book that, it it's it's sort of a, a slow burn, I would say. Like you, you're reading it, you're enjoying it. And then when you actually think about it, there was a lot more layers to it. Mm. Can I put that on? If you click it, it should come up. Yeah. So Chico's, so Chico's miscarriage. I forgot that she had a miscarriage earlier on in the book as well, didn't she? And she was super sad over it for a long time. Um, I I don't know. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it might have something to do with, like, she only has one child, um, whereas her older sister has, what, six? Um, um, and her obsession with her two younger sisters it's almost like they're her children and I feel like she really got into that more as the book went on and partly that's because Yukiko just won't marry anyone but also perhaps this miscarriage has something to do with that like she yeah and also like Tycho's miscarriage was a plot point too like mm -hmm. I feel like it, it's definitely treated more as like a narrative device than I think yeah. Sachiko's which is like more backstory or like characterization mm -hmm. um Tycho's was like she Tycho's one of the most driving forces in the book. So to me, it carries more importance in the book being a, a novel itself. Yeah. Um, as opposed to the other, which feels more like a character development mm -hmm. point. Yeah, you could take you could take Sachiko's miscarriage out and you wouldn't have changed like the plot of the novel at all. It would yeah. still feel very much the same. Um, I do also think Tycho's was a bit like the death of her person in the past. So like, dr like very dramatic, <laughs> as it should be, but like in comparison to other scenes in this book, it was like, oh. Yes, yes, her, the whole, her illness and then her being pregnant and then her losing the baby, it was just like one after the other. Um, it was definitely like that and the flood were both the like speediest parts of the book, the, the bits that felt unput downable almost um it just desperate to find out what was going to happen although i didn't need quite as much description of diarrhea personally i was into it i, don't know. <laughs> like, I, it's, it's, 
I think it, you know, it, to me, it very much felt like potty humor. Like, it felt yeah, like, yeah. It, like you know, it, it felt like a, a nod or a wink. I mean, if if I'm running with this thesis about this being a book about decay, like mm-hmm. that is kind yeah. of the pivotal thing, right? Like, that is like the most, <laughs> the worst thing that it could be. Like, this is what humans yeah. produce. Um, <laughs> and I kind of like it. Yeah. And then after Taika is all better, Yukiko now has diarrhea because she's going to get married. Like, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it was a lot of diarrhea, but it, I can see why, yeah, the relation to the, the decay is a, a point I hadn't considered. I'm not really a potty humour kind of person, so generally it doesn't, doesn't always work for me. <laughs> okay, um, unless there's any more questions, I think we've kind of covered everything um, about the book that I wanted to talk about, so unless anyone else has anything they wanted to add... Give you a minute. Um, I do like this cover very much. Mm. This is a this is a John Gall original. Mm. Uh, this was actually so. Uh, for those who don't know the context, I, I work at Knopf. This was originally published by Knopf in the U.S., which is interesting okay. to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so whenever I was choosing an edition to read from, they're all the same in terms of like the text and translation, same translator mm-hmm. and everything. But like, yeah. I do find this cover very endearing. I uh, I quite those like are this gorgeous. Quite yeah. traditional. Although mine came um, a bit grubby, <laughs> I'm not sure where it came from, but it was a bit grubby. But I really love the um, insides. And there. yeah, those are gorge print, and I think it's like a kimono print, maybe. Like it's really, it's yeah, it's really beautiful. So I'm. Um, I appreciated that as well. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you for joining me um, on the inaugural Big Book Book Club live stream. And thank you for helping me with all of my um, technical difficulties at the start there. Um, <laughs> Matthew, which witnessed me nearly have a breakdown, but it's fine. We... Everything's good. This was wonderful. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank and thanks to, for inviting me to read because I really had a good time. Good. I'm glad you did. Um, and everyone else out there, uh, as I said at the beginning, we will be reading the monster that is war and peace in march and april um so (laughs) i hope you are ready for that um i know that charlotte from queenie reads and milena from milena reads who are reading this with us um are both ready and poised to read this i think we will be reading a couple of different translations as well so that might be interesting to discuss so um whatever translation you have uh, that's i'm sure it will be fine um and thank you for joining us and we'll see you again at the end of april for that live stream Thank you. Bye-bye.